Hello and welcome back to the Indian Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Raj Balkaran. More importantly, you are looking for inspired insight from ancient India, which you can apply to everyday life, and you might like to be told a tale or two. We left off actually telling tales of Durga, the great goddess, Amba, the mother, Jagadamba, the mother of the world. These tales are to be found in this uh, landmark uh, monumental uh, revolutionary text, the Devi Mahatmya, um, where God is a she. (laughs) The Mahatmya, the glory is the grandeur, the greatness um, of the Devi, the goddess, the greatness of the goddess. And so we were um, in the middle of episode three. There are three episodes to the text. And episode three is the most sprawling. Uh, it consists of nine chapters. There are many sub uh, episodes. So, just to set the scene once again, we have uh, two demons, Shumba and Nushumba, usurping the throne of heaven, usurping Indra's throne yet again. And the gods remember the boon they got when the goddess restored their power after Mahisha, the buffalo demon, usurped their throne. Right in episode two the famous Mahisha Sura Mardani, the slayer of the Buffalo Demon episode where the Buffalo Demon usurps their power, she restores their power, they praise her with glorious uh, Sanskrit praise, and she says, I have a boon for you, what do you want? And they're like, well, we have what we want, but please come back. And she's like, okay, whenever you remember me in times of need, I'll return to help, to support. So at the outset of episode three, they remember her. They clamber upon the highest peaks in the Himalayas and they chant the famous Ya Devi Sotram. Ya Devi, to that goddess abiding in all beings, this beautiful, powerful, brilliant meditation on divine imminence, not at the expense of divine transcendence. The Devi Mahatmi is not an either or text, it's a both and text. The supreme power to be supreme cannot be limited by the law of non contradiction. To be supreme, it must be both A and not A, else it is limited. So she is transcendent. She's beyond beyond. She is there at the outset of creation, even before Brahma creates all things in episode one. She's part and parcel of the cosmic uh, scaffolding of uh, the energy of the cosmos. And yet she's also abiding in all beings in the form of their very biorhythms, hunger, thirst, their very consciousness, memory, intellect. Yes. So the hymn, the goddess who abides in all beings, she emerges okay, from the body of Parvati. Again, this theme of embodiment and imminence. And she's resplendent upon the mountainside and the henchmen of Shumba and Nishumba, Chandan Munda, they spy her, they spot her, and they are just taken with how beautiful she is. And this is a brilliant, brilliant uh, insight. Rather than appreciate and value what they see, this resplendent feminine form, mother of all things, as it were, they decide to objectify and commodify her. And they literally think to themselves, hey, she is a jewel among women to be possessed, as all great jewels are. And Shumba and Nushumba have already usurped the throne of Indra, and they have claimed the spoils of the gods. And she is among the spoils to be claimed. So surely she should belong to them. And Shumba and Nushumba happily agree and dispatch a messenger to say, hey, come, else be dragged by your hair. And she's like, well, I made this foolish vow long ago, that the only man I would marry is the man who bests me in battle. And to this day, (laughs) Durga remains unmarried, because none can best she who represents victory itself, Jaya Jaya. This is the common outcry, the cry, the the, the praise, right? Uh, Can I get a hallelujah? Can I get a Jai Ma? (laughs) Jaya Jaya means victory. She is the victory goddess. She represents triumph, sovereignty, Uh, power itself, which remediates a state of disempowerment. She represents that power whereby the disempowered become empowered. 
This is extremely important, especially in our times. This is an extraordinarily timely text, and yet so very few of us are studying it. I suppose <laughs> the universe has left me with some work to do <laughs> over the course of coming decades. But this text is about empowerment, about restoring the power of they who've had their power stolen by others who are not equipped to wield power. And there's a moment in this text where the demon Shumba confronts Durga with this very charge. And we'll see her brilliant and glorious response momentarily. But to set the stage, embassy after embassy on behalf of the demons come. They can't take a hint. Dhuma Lochina, <laughs> the general Smoky Eyes, you can't see straight. Smoky Eyes comes forth and with the outcry, Hum, this is a, an, an homage, a nod to, to mantra, to, 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 to the power of mantra, mantric missile, as I call it, by the power of her, her outcry, Hum, he is reduced to ashes. <laughs> bye bye, Dhuma Lochina. And then Chanda and Munda come and make a mad dash the goddess and from her furrowed brow emaciated terrifying cackling Kali emerges a response a wrathful response to an insolent and dangerous threat <laughs> we need to understand that she's a response she's not a stance she's episodic so she goes forth and she decapitates Chanda and Munda and henceforth is called Chamunda and then they send forth Raktabija, the demon whose boon is such that whenever a drop of blood, Rakta, it's the earth, it is as if a bija, a seed, and creates a new Raktabija. And so none but the maniacal Kali with lolling tongue can lap up every drop of blood, <laughs> um, causing the end of Raktabija. Now, one very important theme in episode three is the theme of, of multiplicity, right? Of expansion. We see beings created, various beings. Kali is created. But also there's a band of mothers, the Saptamatrikas created. Here's a, a rough translation that I, I leaked out a couple of years ago that I'll hopefully publish <laughs> once I find the bandwidth to turn my attention to scholarship amid, you know, podcasting, you know, retreats, classes, etc., etc. At the very moment, O King, you know, as you might recall, it's a conversation between the sage and the king. In order to annihilate the enemies of the gods, indeed, to ensure the welfare of the god supreme, exceedingly val valorous and powerful shaktis, goddesses' powers approached the goddess, Chandika is her name, were two great epithets in the text were Amba, Ambika, the mother, and Chandika, the fierce one. Um, having sprung forth in the bodies of the gods, so energies come out of the bodies of the gods. This is similar to episode two, where energies come out of the tejas, the light, the splendor, the fire of all of the gods. So from seven particular gods, Brahma, Shiva, Skanda, Vishnu, Indra, um, come forth these mm, powers, these energies, okay? Uh, whatever form, whatever ornament, whatever mount the god possessed, so too did his Shakti possess to fight the demon hordes. So these are feminine aspects of masculine deities. So the text is telling us this idea of consort goddesses, the feminine aspect of the masculine deities of Parvati is the consort of Shiva, Lakshmi, the consort of Vishnu, Saraswati, the consort of Brahma. The text is telling us that these powers that are innate to the gods are actually, though emerging from the gods, they're actually part of the fabric of the one primordial power, which the Supreme Goddess represents. The text is a brilliant uh, reflection on the nature and mechanics of power, of divine power and the way in which power can be leveraged in a social, circumstantial, um, even sociopolitical sense. Very, very timely text. 
in a celestial chariot drawn by swans with rosary and water pot in hand, came forth the Shakti of Brahma. Brahma, of course, is the creator. He doesn't have any weapons. She is known as Brahmani. Maheshwari arrived astride a bull. Maheshwara is the Shiva, right? Bearing the best of tridents. Donning serpent bracelets adorned by the crescent moon. The mother in the form of Kaumari. Kumara is Skanda. Spear in hand astride the finest peacock mount, went forth to fight the demons as the feminine form of Skanda. Skanda is uh, Kumara. Okay. Then the Shakti Vaishnavi came forth, mounted on the eagle Garuda, bearing discus and conch and club and bow and sword. Then the Shakti of Hari, Varahi, came forth, assuming the distinct form of a sacrificial boar. Then came forth Narasimhi, from Vishnu's man lion form, scattering the stars of heaven by the toss of her lion mane. Then ushered forth Indri, uh, it's a derivative of Indra, with thunderbolt in hand upon her elephant mount, like Indra possessing a thousand eyes. Then Shiva, surrounded by these shaktis of the gods, declared to Chandika, my pleasure is a swift slaughter of the demons. Thereupon, from the body of the goddess, sprang forth the terrifying Shakti of Chandika herself, Rusam howling like a hundred jackals. And so, this episode features the, the, the manifestation, the issuing forth of a variety of Shaktis or powers or energies or beings, entities, right? This ode to mul multiplicity manifestation. And um, as we know, the goddesses hordes with the Saptamatakas, the seven mothers, and Kali and Chandika, etc., etc., they are successful against um, Raktabija. And this is where we pretty much left off, where the king actually interjects. It's interesting, actually. Out of nowhere, the king, at the beginning of chapter 9, he interjects to say, wow, this is like amazing. Wow, this is astonishing, uh, good sir, hearing about the feats of the goddess, especially the slaying of Bloodseed of Raktabija. Tell me more. I wish to hear more about what Shumba and Nishumba did outrage, no doubt, now that Bloodseed is dead. And of course, <laughs> they were outraged. And, you know, Nishumba himself comes and faces the goddess and she does battle with him. Her armies face his armies, and then he too is destroyed. So now what do we have? From all of these embassies of the demons, all that is left is their overlord, um, Shumba himself. His brother Shumba now slain. So what does that look like? He finally comes, you know, beholding the corpse of Nishumba, dear to him as life, Beholding his army slaughtered, the enraged Shumba spoke these words. So it's now a face-off. It's sort of, there's a, a Durga, or Devi Ambika, the goddess, and Shumba, the demon overlord. Okay, And he says something fascinating. He says, oh Durga, wicked and proud of your strength, do not display your pride before me. You rely on the strength of others to fight with your inflated sense of importance. This is fascinating. This text really does a great job of encapsulating this sort of demonic, narcissistic, trolly personality where, you know, they won't take no for an answer. Uh, they want to own and possess whatever they can, use and abuse whatever they can. They're the center of the universe. And all they do is project. They're bereft of substance all packaging if even, and they're happy to accuse others of the same. This should sound very, very familiar to you, actually. So here is this demon accusing the mother of the universe of being uh, bereft of strength, <laughs> of being arrogant with self-importance, and of relying on the strength of others. What does she say? Ah, uh, it gave up. She says, I alone exist here in all the world. What second other than I exists? Behold, O oh wicked one, is these manifestations of my power now enter back into me. What a riveting scene. Her manifestations of power. 
are all long before Netflix, long before comics. Right? This is profound, um, fantastic, and fantastical, uh, larger than life storytelling. Yes. Thereupon, all the goddesses led by Brahmani went to their resting place in the abode of the goddess. Then there was just the mother alone, Devi Vacha, the goddess said. I've now withdrawn my many forms established here by my extraordinary power. <laughs> I stand here utterly alone, irresolute in battle, on guard. Right? Get with it. Stuff's about to get real, kids. <laughs> A fierce battle then ensued between the two of them, the goddess and Shumba. As the demons and gods looked on, arousing fear throughout the entire world, the battle entailed showers of arrows, sharp weapons, and dreadful missiles. Ambika unleashed divine weapons by the hundreds, which a demon lord destroyed with counterstrikes of his own. The supreme queen destroyed, as if in play, the gleaming missiles that he hurled. With her dreadful utterance, whom, here's her magic missile once again. Then the demon enveloped the goddess, showering her with arrows and rage. The goddess shattered his bow with arrows of her own. His bow now broken, the demon lord took up his spear, but the goddess destroyed it with her discus, even as it rested in his hand. Then raising up his lustrous sword and blazing with a hundred moons, the demon lord rushed towards the goddess. Tundika broke his sword, even as he advanced with sharp arrows shot from her bow, and she also broke his shield, shining as the sun. His steed now slain, his bow, his bow now broken, without a charioteer, the demon picked up his fearsome club in an effort to slay the goddess. She shattered the club of the onrushing one with her, with her arrows sharp. Then he rushed at her with his upraised fist. The demon lord brought down his fist towards the Davy's heart, but she then struck him in the chest with her own clenched hand. Her forceful blow knocked the demon lord to the ground, but he at once again rose up. Springing up, he seized the goddess and climbed high in the sky in midair, where Chandika did battle with him without any support. The goddess and the demon did battle in the sky in unprecedented sight, with a st which astonished even the sages. Having grappled for some time midair, the goddess snatched him up, and swinging him round, hurled him to the earth. Instantly hurled on hitting the earth, the demon raised his fist and ran at Chandika, desirous of destroying the goddess. The goddess then knocked the unrushing demon lord to the ground, even as he ran, piercing his chest with her spear. Pierced by the tip of the goddess's spear, his life breath now departed. He fell to the ground, shaking the earth, causing the oceans and islands and mountains to tremble. When that wicked one was slain, the universe was soothed regaining its natural order once more, and the sky became spotless. The flaming clouds of portent that formerly gathered became tranquil, and the rivers flowed once again with, within their bank. When, when Shumba was felled, the hosts of gods were overjoyed when the demon lord was slain, and the celestial musicians sang aloud with joyous gay abandon. Others sounded their instruments, and the celestial nymphs danced about. The winds of favor, the winds of fortune began to blow again, and the sun shone brightly as before. The sacred fire as peacefully blazed, and the din that filled the air was gone. This is uh, a translation of chapter 10 of the Devi Mahatmya, the encounter with Shumba. So now what? Now, well, the demons are gone. So the, the power of the gods has de facto been restored. What's left now? Chapter 11 is actually uh, home of the fourth and final hymn of the Devi Mahatmya. As you may or may not recall, uh, the first hymn was in chapter 1 where Brahma was invoking the goddess. second hymn was in chapter 4 where the gods were praising the goddess for slaying Mahisha, the buffalo demon. The third hymn was in chapter 5, the famous Yadevi hymn where the gods were inv again invoking the goddess and the pattern is completed here where there's a please him a thank you him a please him and this is the final him a thank you him a thanksgiving him the narayani stuti narayani namos today when the goddess had slain the demon lord indra and his entourage of gods led by agni praise katyayani for fulfilling their wishes their faces made radiant their desires manifest 
Devi Papanati Hare Prasida Prasida Matar Jakatau Kilasya Prasida Vishveshwari Pahi Vishwam Tamishwari Devi Chara Charasya Be gracious, Prasida, be pleased. Be gracious, O goddess, who takes away suffering. Be gracious to all who seek refuge in you. Be gracious, O mother of the entire world. Be gracious, protect us, O queen. O queen of all that moves and does not move. And they go on and on and on. All branches of knowledge are aspects of you, as are all women across the worlds, O goddess. The world is filled by you alone, Divine Mother. What song shall suffice for you who are beyond praise? I.e., you are the power of praise itself. <laughs> what can we offer you which is not already yours? When you, goddess, who is everything, grant heaven and ultimate freedom, when praised, what words could suffice to extol you? <clears throat> o you who abide in the heart of all in the form of intelligence, granting heaven and ultimate freedom, obeisance not I in you. We bow to you, not I need him most today. Okay. And they go on and on. O blessing of blessings, Sarva Mangala Mangalie. Auspicious one, O you who accomplish every aim, O shining one, O thrived refuge, obeisance, not I need we bow to you, not I need most today. O you who are the power of creation, of sustenance and destruction, to eternal one, O you who abide in primordial matter, O you comprising its qualities, obeisance now Rayani, we bow to you. O you who are intent on the rescue of the afflicted and downtrodden, O you who remove the suffering of all, obeisance now Rayani, we bow to you. It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn, and the hymns are they are thematically rich insofar as they they encapsulate much of the qualities, the exalted qualities of the goddess. They posit a, a philosophy, a theology, a vision of power, a vision of feminine power, which pervades the cosmos, abides in all beings, and is yet beyond them as well. And in order to understand that vision, one needs to really meditate upon the hymns read them over and over again, whether in the Sanskrit or in translation. It is uh, mind-boggling. And so it should be. How could one posit um, an ontological supreme? How could one grapple with the mysteries of life? Indeed, the greatest mystery that is understood as a source of all life and the sex, uh, the, the mother itself, the source of all things. How could one do so in a manner that was simple and straightforward and amenable to logical linear scrutiny? scrutiny? Certainly. The complexities and complexities of existence are beyond linear thinking. Not that they are ultimately chaotic, but that they are complex, multi dimensional, multi-perspectival, perhaps even paradoxical. And so the issue forth is a glorious praise, and then the goddess thanks them, and she essentially declares that she will return time and time and time again whenever there is need. Whenever folks need protecting, she'll return. Indeed, the following chapter, chapter 12, is essentially the palashruti, the, the fruit. It begins, uh, I shall destroy all misfortunes without doubt, for they who ever praise me with these hymns, with composed mind, with collected mind. So the text is, is indicating the application of the text, that these hymns are useful. These verses, these tales, these acts, these feats are useful for the destruction of misfortune, for the destruction of suffering. And she goes on and on about the various types of calamity and dangers and hazards against which um, contemplation and engagement of this text will protect. And it's utterly fascinating. And of course, having finished the three tales, <laughs> the 
sage says to the king, remember the sage and the king? All of these tales are being told by a sage to a king in a forest, and this is very important to my mind. Um, this is an encoding, a narrative encapsulation, a metaphor for aspects of self. We can think of the city as the conscious mind and the forest, perhaps the Gahanam Vanham, the deep dark forest, as the unconscious, where that is the locus of both animals and sages, both our animal instincts and our supernatural or paranormal aspects might be understood as beyond our waking consciousness. And the conversation between the sage and the king is fascinating in that the king is the doer, it's the eye. We are the king of our castle, so to speak, ideally, unless we are in relationship with those who have stolen our power. The king has had his power stolen. And the sage is our inner wisdom. The inner wisdom about the mechanics of power, about the mechanics of creation, about the mechanics of the universe, about the process whereby one can reclaim one's power. And so the sage says to the king, such is the power of the goddess who supports this entire universe. Such is how truth is fashioned by the goddess. She who deludes even the gods. You, this merchant. Remember the merchant sitting there as if a witness? Well, his name is Samadhi, right? He's sort of the, the witness aspect, the Atman, if you will. You, this merchant, and other learned men are deluded by her. Others like you were deluded in past, and so too will others be deluded in future. Thus, O king, take refuge in her, for she is the supreme sovereign of the universe. Once invoked, she grants humans worldly enjoyments, heaven, and even liberation. This is very, very important. She grants... She's Bhukti Mukti Pradayini. She grants enjoyment. She grants mundane blessings, worldly blessings, as well as transcendence or transformation or spiritual blessings. This is extremely important because this is well post Upanishads, post, this is post Mahabharata. Right? Mahabharata has to grapple with the, this dual legacy of Vedic world affirmation and Upanishadic world denial. Hinduism itself, actually, the Indic world has to straddle this tension between the householder and the renouncer, between whether we are here to focus on this life or the next, or whatever that looks like. And she, to be the primordial power, she is the source of both. Very, very clever. Yet, in my view, unlike the view of perhaps some other scholars who have studied this text, she favors one of these two. She's happy to give you liberation. She's happy to help you prosper in the world. But surprisingly, there's one that she perhaps favors, and it's not the one you might suspect. Upon hearing these words, these wise words, the king paid homage to the illustrious sage, weary with concern, longing for his kingdom. He immediately went forth to practice austerities along with his merchant companion. The king and merchant were intent on receiving a vision of the mother, so they settled down along a riverbank and practiced great austerities, reciting the supreme goddess hymn all the while. They fashioned an earthen image along the riverbank through which they worshipped the goddess with flowers, incense, fire, and water. This is puja, right? This is the idiom of bhakti devotionalism. They sometimes severely restricted their diet. They, they fasted uh, entirely. Sometimes they fasted partially. They even made offerings sprinkled with the blood of their own limbs, with minds composed or thoughts focused on the goddess. For three long years, they worshipped her in this austere manner, upon which the goddess manifested before them and said in her delight, Receive from me all you seek, O king, and you as well, O merchant. Pleased by your penance, I shall bestow it now. Then the king wished for the return of his kingdom, his enemies overthrown. Along with the kingdom that would not perish, even in another lifetime. But that wise merchant, disheartened by the cares of the world, wished for that supreme insight which severs attachment eroding all sense of I-ness and minus of me and mine. O king, said the goddess, in just a few days' time you shall reclaim your throne, conquering your enemies, it will be yours forevermore. Then in your next life, 
you shall receive a birth from the sun god, the Vasvan, whereby you will become Manu, the next Manu Savarani, lord of the age. So the king gets a little top up. You'll have your kingdom. It'll be restored. It'll be yours forever. No one will ever be able to take it from you. And in your next life, you know, we need this kind of talent, kid. I got big plans for you. <laughs> in your next life, you'll be lord of an age, the Manu Savarani, son of the sun. And then she turns to the merchant. O best of merchants, I too grant the boon you so earnestly seek. That insight which leads to human perfection shall be yours. Having granted each his desired boon, the goddess vanished, as the merchant and king elated devoutly sung her praises. Thus, receiving a boon from the goddess, Suratha, this is the name of the king, best of rulers, will receive another birth from the sun and will become Savarni Manu of the next age. So the Devi Mahatmya, this is the very end of the Devi Mahatmya, and the frame latches it into the Manvantara section. The section of the text that talks about Manus, uh, primordial patriarchs, past and future. Yes, so we are currently under the reign of Vaivasvata. And he's also a son of the sun. And the next one will be Savarni. And so this entire text, the glories of the goddess, are rendered as part of the making of a Manu. And the restoration of the power of a king. What do all of these things have in common? They all have to do with preservation. Preserving this realm. Not opting out. What is Krishna saying to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita? Forget your begging bowl idea, bro. You, you need to be in the world right now. You need to exhaust your commerce, exhaust your duties. You need to serve the world. This is the highest path for you. And to my mind, the goddess very much echoes this and even pushes the envelope a bit further to say, look, moksha is very important, but this realm is not to be forsaken. And we need noble kings to rule this realm. We need noble manus to rule this realm. The, the Devi Mahatmya, the glories of the goddess, um, through all 13 chapters, are actually considered... Uh, chapters 81 to 93 of the Markande Purana. They're couched in the Markande Purana, in the Manvantara section of the Markande Purana. This is the Puranic corpus that is mouthed by Markandeya. The sage Markandeya is unique among sages in that he has received a boom from Shiva to be preserved across ages, to be forever young. Be forever 16 years old to live forever. Again, what do we have? The theme of preservation. This is extremely important. So part of what's so incredibly compelling about the goddess and her glories and this, this monumental revolutionary text is its emphasis on world affirmation, world preservation what better platform can we find within the indic world or beyond to fruitfully move forward to revere and protect our globe to revere and protect our social fabric to revere and protect the creatures of this planet to revere and protect our fellow humans Reflect on the world we would live in were the ideas in this text taken seriously. I hope you've enjoyed hearing these glories a fraction as much as I've enjoyed sharing them with you. And maybe you've even especially enjoyed a little leak of this translation that's been sitting on my desk for two years. It just needs to get off to a publisher there's actually a very reputable publisher waiting for it so i should do that <laughs> um 
in the interim, please, please study with me. Come study with me at the Indian Wisdom School. I have a number of goddess courses that you might enjoy. You can have live live Zoom tutorial with me as well. Um, what else? You may be interested in a retreat in person. Definitely come study at the school first. And you'll get to know more of myself and my style and make sure it's a good fit. And um, if I can give service in any way, I'm not difficult to get a hold of. Washbalkorn.com or IndianWisdomSchool.com. Take good care of yourself. Till next time. Namaste.